Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is John Quelch, the uh, Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and I'm delighted uh, today to welcome you to this Herbert Half Hour uh, with Meg Daly, uh, whose name is synonymous with uh, the underline. Uh, Meg, uh, welcome to uh, our Herbert Half Hour today. Thank you, and thanks so much for inviting me. I saw that lineup. I, I feel lucky to have a seat at the table. Oh, not at all, not at all. Um, it's a very important project. So let, let's get started, if we may. And I, I'd love for you to just explain a little bit of the background to our audience. Um, uh, where did the idea for the underline come from? And perhaps also, uh, where did the name underline come from as well? That's a great question. I, I want to add that my husband and my family live right across from the University of Miami on the other side of US-1, so we're neighbors. Um, and uh, the University of Miami community has been incredibly helpful in this project through visioning exercises and, and supporting us in so many ways, including board representation. Um, so the idea for the underline came about um, seven years ago. I had a bike accident and broke both of my arms, uh, which means I couldn't drive and I needed to get to physical therapy. And after a couple of months of you know, healing and being driven by everybody to physical therapy on US-1 in Coconut Grove, I thought, oh, I can, I can take the train at the University of Miami Station, hop off in Coconut Grove and walk that little stretch to 22nd Avenue. And I gotta tell you, um, Dean, there's something about slowing down and not driving. It gives you the ability to really see your city and your community in a very different way. So I sort of call it my rose-colored glasses. I, I saw you know, the dead land below Metro Rail and had this aha moment, why don't we turn it into a community amenity? And so that was sort of the big idea. And I have a marketing background. So what do marketers do? We talk a lot and, <laughs> and sort of shop the idea. And everybody was saying, that's a great idea. So all of you, all of you business folks out there, if you have 90% of the people saying it's a great idea, it's something that you think is worth striking out and maybe pursuing. And, and what about the name underline? I, I think there's a good story associated with that, right? Well, you, so we, we are a nonprofit, and so we rely on the help of others. And I have leaned heavily on my family and friends and partners and, and, and the community around us. So the name of the underline was called the Green Link. And, um, and we had a website. I, I see that, that Knight Foundation is one of the funders for this program. And the Knight Foundation was an early supporter. And um, my daughter ended up dating a guy who worked at Pentagram, one of the lead uh, branding companies worldwide um, for a Kickstarter she did for Neil Young. And he was part of that Kickstarter team for the graphic design. And so they were dating and she's like, oh, my mom's working on this incredible project called the Green Link and you need to know about it. And he sat me down my first time I met him in New York and he told me all the reasons why the name Green Link was horrible. And he's, he's Australian, so I'm gonna do a very bad Australian accent. He said, green, 80s, link, transportation. <laughs> <laughs> the new name is the underline. <laughs> so, so I'm like, oh, that's a great name, darn. And so I went to the Knight Foundation, Miami Foundation, and our small little um, team of donors and volunteers. And they're like, that's the name. We're going with it. And it's award winning. You know, we've gotten national recognition, yeah. international recognition for the name, thanks to Hamish Smythe. But I, I want to go back to the uh, your own personal involvement because. To, you had been in the private sector for some time, uh, as you said, in various marketing positions. What, what gave you the, the strength, the courage, the determination uh, to uh, take on this, uh, which was essentially an entrepreneurial startup when you took it on? Well, some would argue, Dean, that we're still in startup mode. So I, yeah. I, look, I look forward to being um, a middle-aged company someday soon. Um, you know what I always I always say that everything I've done in the past has led me to today and when one way or another um, work has prepared me for um, embarking on a project of this scale. This is a hundred and forty million dollar project. 
Um, the Friends is a small nonprofit. So, so being an entrepreneur really is sort of you're scrappy, you're opportunistic, um, you juggle lots and lots of balls at the same time. If we ever did this project in a linear fashion, it would, it would take 40 years. Um, so I would say first, um, you know, keep your eyes in 180 degree directions. So you're always looking for that next opportunity because you, one door may close, but 10 may still be open, uh, which is very entrepreneurial. Um, pivot all the time. Like we pivoted Green Link, you know, within 24 hours, we were the underline. Um, and also being open to um, having others help you um, and don't think you have all the answers. Um, so, mm -hmm. The first thing I did was, you know, shop the idea and, and found that there were not, not just a lot of people who thought it was a great idea. There were a lot of people who wanted to help and, you know, sort of being an A-type personality and running my own business. It was like, well, I don't need the help of others. Well, absolutely accept people's help and get their advice um, and allow them to be part of your army. Um, I think I, I saw a name in the lineup of, of people here is um, Brooke Friedland, who was one of our volunteers. And, you know, so there's ways for students and, and grownups and kids to all be part of this program. Um, and the other thing I think that um, coming out of marketing is communication is, is so important. And believe it or not, a lot of people do not know how to communicate, do not know how to deliver an elevator pitch do not pivot their pitch to whoever they're talking to. And, and you really have to know who your audience is uh, for your message to resonate. All right, some, some great, uh, great tips there. Um, let, let's just uh, uh, broaden out for a little moment, uh, thinking about the, the High Line uh, in New York, which I think quite a few people uh, are familiar with as well. Um, how does that compare with uh, the underline in Miami? Um, they seem to be um, similar, but I think there, there are many differences, right? Absolutely. Um, we share the name, the word, the line in our names. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we were, um, the, the high line is an abandoned rail. We're in a former rail corridor. This is where the Flagler Rail was, um, was, was purchased in the 70s. Um, and, and so I think the real similarity is, a, is a, a new genre of redevelopment called adaptive reuse. And, and we are now part of a consortium of projects like ourselves that have these industrial um, stories before the new sort of hybrid product that it is now. We are a park, we're a trail, we're an art destination, we're a community gathering place, we're a, um, a project that you have, we have um, urban reforestation. So there's environmental sustainability component of this. Um, and then all the things that you can do here for health and wellness. So you're taking sort of this dead infrastructure and giving it many, many lives. And that's where we're very similar. Uh, the dissimilarity is that the high line is 30 feet wide, the underline is 100 feet wide, the high line is two miles long, the, the underline is 10 miles long, the, the high line is elevated, the underline is at grade at ground level, so we're very porous and we're open 24-7, 365 as we're considered um, a transportation corridor. Can, can you just uh, explain the Brickle Backyard? Uh, portion of the project, which I think is the first part of the project to open, and and earlier this year, I believe, is when it opened, right? Yeah, February 26th. Mm -hmm. um, so the underline um, is a repurposing project of the land below Metro Rail, as you know, as our elevated train from the Miami River to Dade Land South. It's 10 miles long, 120 acres, and it goes on county land through three very distinct uh, communities in city of Miami, Coral Gables, and South Miami. The University of Miami is one of the largest landowners that fronts the underline and one of the many communities and families we serve. Um, the Brickle Backyard is our first half mile. It's nine acres. It opened in February and it's a really very urban, I, I'm looking out my window because it's right in front of me actually, um, and we have um, an outdoor gym for soccer and basketball. The entire nine acres is a pollinator park. All of the plants and native vegetation attract um, butterflies, bees, and birds. 
we have a sound stage for performances. Um, we have a big dining table. So post COVID, you guys bring your bag lunches and, and have lunch out here. And we have um, two art installations already. Um, and we also have a beautiful sort of meditative area uh, connecting to the Miami River and the Miami River Greenway. Um, it's sort of like the soft, loamy green infrastructure, uh, which is great for people to walk their dogs. Uh, you mentioned uh, COVID there for a moment. Um, net net, has COVID been uh, a negative or a positive? Uh, in a way, it could be seen as emphasizing the need for uh, these types of uh, facilities. That's, I mean, outdoor. That's, that's a great question. Um, a few things. One, it has endorsed the, the need for the outdoor economy. Um, what can we put in these public spaces that create vibrant, vibrant public spaces that also have commerce? So pop-up businesses. We just did this great program through um, the Children's Trust, some budding entrepreneurs, these high school mm -hmm. um, students launched their businesses on the underline. Um, and then we have we had a call for pop-up businesses on the underline because everybody feels safe outdoors uh, because COVID is airborne. Also, when we were in quarantine, uh, we have one lowly counter that actually tracked the usage of the current empath, which is the, the existing trail, future underline, and the use of that quadrupled. Um, there's all these great stories about bike shortages during quarantine. Mm -hmm. Kids learned how to bike for the first time. Adults dust dusted their bikes off. Um, and we sort of discovered we can walk with our families and we felt safe because cars were really not on the road. So we haven't really talked about um, the safety condition and one of the key drivers of this project has been, you know, trying to create a safe condition for people to walk and bike, kids to bike to school, walk to school, elderly to be out in their community, being able to connect to other neighborhoods. And that's really been also the key driver of the funding sources is for transportation and improving public safety. So apropos that, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the fact that you're a surface project and therefore there are many road crossings uh, throughout this 10 miles of, uh, of uh, potential underlying trail. Um, people aren't really necessarily going to be comfortable walking from one end to another or cycling from one end to another unless there are improvements made in the safety of the crossings. Yeah, and I will add that I have seen many of your students get in their car at the University of Miami and drive across the street to get to Starbucks because it doesn't feel safe to cross US-1 on foot, right? Um, so we have had, we've counted over a hundred public meetings Two of them were at the University of Miami School of Architecture when we were going through our master planning process. And people had great ideas on how to improve our, our crossings, which include um, widening them. Uh, they triple the width of the current condition. Um, we paint them bright green so they're much more visible. Uh, we're also offsetting them from US-1 uh, by a minimum condition, particularly actually at sunset we're moving it entirely off of US-1 and moving it to mid-street. Um, and the other is changing um, the amount of time we have to cross the street. We're increase, increasing the cross time and also restricting traffic movement as you're crossing the street. So if I'm on foot, mm -hmm. on a bike, on a wheelchair, a walker, I need time to get into the crosswalk so that the cars can see that I'm there. So we're now prioritizing the pedestrian and the cyclist, or at least giving them equal ground as a car. Yeah. All modes need to be represented. This is a multimodal corridor. Fine. Um, uh, earlier, you um, uh, mentioned that the overall investment in the project was uh, potentially around $140 million. And I wonder whether you could now just spend a little bit more uh, wearing your time wearing your business hat how, how is the 140 million uh, allocated and where is the 140 million coming from? Um, well, so a lot of people um, think that that 140 million passes through our organization. Um, we have the role of being cheerleader, 
vigilant advocates, right? So, so we're the one always ringing the bell and, and in many cases making the ask. Um, but I, I have to say the partnership that we have had with Miami-Dade County has been um, incredibly rewarding. Um, there are unsung heroes in the public sector, which, you know, if any of your business students think it's an unworthy profession, there are some very talented committee pe um, um, committed people in that space. So the, the breakdown of the funding and what we, we like to call this a funding lasagna, because there is no one funding source. If you're building a highway, you can go to FHWA, FDOT, USDOT. There's lots of funding sources for highways and roads, as well as water and other infrastructure. But there isn't anything for industrial reuse. So the, the funding sources that we have are 23 million in a federal grant called BUILD, which is now RAISE, and it's what they consider a smaller infrastructure grant. I will add, again, the strength of communication skills. I co-wrote that with my partner in the, in the County uh, Department of Transportation and Public Works and a pro bono attorney. Usually consultants get paid a lot of money for that work. Um, so that was very rewarding. Um, over $80 million in road impact fees. This is the first time that county road impact fees have been used for a trail project. And that's because of the multimodal condition. Um, the city of Miami has committed up to 15. We dropped their $50 million commitment to 15 because we had other funding sources come in. City of Coral Gables has committed 7 million um, and, um, and then 15 million from the state of Florida through a variety of appropriations, which are basically earmarks. So all those funds get directed to the county. Some of them are reimbursable, you know, so it, you need a big entity that has a bank account that can support um, a, re a reimbursable condition. We have three construction phases. The first is the Brickle Backyard. The second is two miles long, which will, I just found out yesterday, will break We'll start construction August 30th, um, and that goes from Coral Way to North Grove. And because of this, that federal grant I talked about, um, that triggered a very, very fast timetable. This project has to be completed by early 2026, making this the fastest moving project of its scope in, the, in North America. And that segment includes University of Miami, and it's from North Grove all the way to Dave Land in one seven mile stretch. Fantastic. So, so from uh, the point of view of evaluating success, uh, obviously on time completion is probably a part of that, but uh, what, what are some of the uh, more uh, human measures of ROI, if I can put it that way? Um, sure. Um, HRNA, um, very early, they're an economic consultancy advisory out of New York who've done in every, every significant park in the United States, including the High Line, which they actually undervalued its economic impact substantially. Um, so that they call it value creation. And what is the value does, that this green space creates? Um, obviously, real estate value appreciation. Um, over $3 billion of projected real estate development along the corridor, $50 million in new annual tax receipts, you know, so you can see where the return and investment starts to happen pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, how do you, how do you talk about quality of life? How do you talk about, you know, how do you quantify me being able to get out of my car or your students or your faculty and staff being able to sort of congregate in this beautiful space, connecting to mass transit. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful places to wait for a bus in Miami-Dade County. Um, mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you quantify building community? How do you quantify building a better city? You know, so when Amazon was gonna come here, one of their key requirements was a more walkable, bikeable city with connections to mass transit. And although Miami was shortlisted, we didn't make the first number, the first slot. So we have to think about how do we build a better city? How is it more livable? How does it attract and keep the talent that you're producing at the University of Miami here to help grow our business base? Um, 
we, we just welcomed 800 or so new freshmen to uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Um, how might uh, some of them become involved in the underlying project? We have so many ways to volunteer. You go to the underline.org. Um, we we are we want to make sure whoever volunteers for us, you know, is something that resonates for them. Um, simple stuff like we have gardening and weeding days. We call them day in the dirt. Uh, we have a great group called the Collective. Our young professionals. We have three married couples out of that group, so there's love on the line. So. <laughs> Um, and we have a number of ways, so many ways to volunteer, whether you love yoga, biking. Um, we also work with your group called Bike Safe. Um, so we lead bike rides. So literally there's something for everyone here. If you're all about art, if you're all about business, if you're all about reading, we have a volunteer who's gonna start reading to kids, um, a student at Ransom Everglades once a month and that's through books and books. So yeah, come play in our sandbox. There's so much to do here. Okay, thanks uh, for that invite. Now, uh, just just uh, a word or two from you, I think, would be very interesting for our audience on um, the differences between running or leading a nonprofit organization uh, versus the private sector. What, what what are the differences in management and leadership? Um, capabilities um, or relative weights put on different aspects of leadership uh, when you compare one with the other? We'll start with I'm a full-time volunteer. So there are very, they're only startup like for profits have volunteers, but they're equity based because they have a betting on the come. Um, I'm, I'm just betting on a better community and a better place for my grandchildren to live. Um, so, um, there's also like some very strong differences in the way you report to the IRS. I mean, so you have accounting differences. Um, because we're on county land um, and we have a 56 page um, management agreement with Miami-Dade County, we have internal audits with Miami-Dade County where, they, where we have to present our books, they have to approve them, they have to approve our budgets. So there is an oversight of us as managers. So the county builds, we manage. Um, the minute you're collecting a single public dollar, you know, you have, you have, you have someone to report to, right? So um, and that's, that's significant. And then, and also, you know, donor relations, people think it's very different. It's a lot like the, you know, the sales cycle. There is pipeline where you have projections, your projections then determine your revenue. Um, so forecasting is very similar to the private sector. And structurally, you know, we're very similar as well, um, but we are not for profit, you know, so having revenue streams is very unusual, you know, so this high idea of the outdoor, um, the, the outdoor commerce, you know, bringing it to life and being able to monetize it. We also have this um, tech master plan, which was funded by the Knight Foundation, which potentially we could unlock a for-profit component of technology that could help public spaces around the country. But the other piece that's completely different, completely different is that all these people trying to bring their value and their skill to our project as a volunteer. So we have this currency that is so unlike the for-profit sector, which is people saying, I wanna help. So I was say that that's a distinct difference. So the reporting, having free value from um, skilled, skilled volunteers and unskilled. And then, and then but the similarity is, you know, from top down revenue is still a key driver. You got to make sure you can keep the doors open and you can deliver high quality service. We want to be like the Disney quality of public spaces um, and set the gold standard for how this can be beautiful um, for an enduring period of time. So a couple of good questions uh, coming over uh, through uh, our Q&A feed. Uh, what one is, um, could, could you just describe um, perhaps a moment of disappointment along the journey and how you cope with that and uh, bounce back? You know, I, I really think the multitasking, always having so many opportunities in the air, 
as crazy as some of them may seem, um, if, if you sort of put all your eggs in one basket, you will have most likely one big disappointment, right? So spreading your risk around mm -hmm. with your funding base has been very helpful. Um, the biggest disappointment I, I had in, is, was when my father died. Um, and that's probably a very unusual answer um, because the, the one person, the first person who, to say that they thought this was a good idea was my dad. Um, mm -hmm. and my dad had creds. Like, so he was the founder of the Performing Arts Center. My family was you know, heavily involved in saving the Biltmore Hotel. Um, so philanthropy sort of runs in our veins, but my dad you know, is the example. And, and when he said that it wasn't a crazy idea, you know, I, very, I very early sort of said, let's do this together. So it was the first time that my dad was a partner with me in, in any adventure and we were peers. And when he passed away, that was, that was great loss. The good news is I'd surrounded by myself um, with a lot of believers in the project and they really lifted me up. And they, and they got me through some very, dark, um, very dark days. Understandable. Um, just looking forward over the next, let's say three to five years, um, what would be the, the two or three most important inflection points? In other words, if we're, if we're following this in the news rather than as a member of the, uh, the board of trustees, um, you know, what, what would we expect to see popping up on the news feed about the underlying, uh, if, all, if all is going according to plan? Well, if, if you're not seeing anything that equates to excellence, I hope someone lets us know. Um, because we're not doing our job. Um, we are working on um, funding the ongoing uh, management op organization, uh, which we also lead. And, um, and I, it tests us daily uh, because of the complexity of operating um, 10 miles. Imagine we have yoga classes in five places on one given Saturday, right? So 10 miles is a lot of product to program. Um, but what you'll be seeing in the next three to five years is the delivery of phase two and the construction of phase three. Um, there will be inconvenience. You may have a, you may have a crossing that's closed so that for construction. So just, I, I want to, I assure you it's for a better world. So, so bear with us and be patient. Um, but yeah, like we take, oops, I think we lost the Dean. So I will share with everybody that, um, you know, let us know what we can do better. Um, and, and we really do believe in listening and every, every idea is a good idea. So let us know how we can bring your good ideas to life. Excellent. Uh, and ju just as a, a, a final thought, um, I think uh, recently there's some news about some additional trustees uh, that have been appointed uh, to the underline. Um, from the University of Miami. Can you speak to that? Well, actually, it was not an appointment. We absolutely stopped uh, Rudy Fernandez and, and Donna Shalala, for, former president and congresswoman, because we think that they are some of the most talented people in Miami-Dade County and represent our incredible partners at the University of Miami. Um, so, um, we have, we are, we, we built this organization on partnerships and, and also friendships. So we're very mm -hmm. happy to have them on our board of, um, on our, our board of, um, our board, our board, oh, our chairs, no, I'm sorry, board of trustees. And, um, and, and we think they're great additions. Um, I would not, I would be remiss if Alberto Abarguin's watching. Sometimes he sneaks in from the Knight Foundation. He says, we always have to make an appeal. So if anybody wants to make a donation to your University of Miami and to the underline, uh, we both do great work. And um, you can find us at the underline.org. You can also join as a volunteer at the underline.org. And um, we really look forward to being your friend moving forward. Well, that's a really uh, great way to end uh, this half hour, Meg. And uh, thanks so much for joining us and for enlightening us on how the project uh, started and how it evolved. And uh, uh, thanks for sharing uh, a couple of personal stories as well that uh, 
uh, many who think they know everything about the underline may not have heard before. So congratulations on what you've done so far. And uh, as neighbors of the underline, we uh, look forward to supporting and uh, benefiting from all of the good work. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to give a shout out to all of my team that is um, watching. They do great work every day. Thanks to all of you and certainly to our friends at UM. We, we would not be where we are uh, without your help and assistance and your great talent at the university. All right. Well, thank you, Meg. And uh, uh, thanks to all of you for joining us for this Herbert half hour and good afternoon from Miami.